episode, we filmed at Mad Fox Brewing Company, and brewer Bill Madden was planning to leave for the Great American Beer Festival, where he was going to act as the capacity as a judge and pour his beers. Um, it just so happens that the next brewery on our itinerary is was Devil's Backbone Brewery, who actually just happened to do quite well at that festival. I believe they were awarded four medals, the same as last year, uh, this time two golds. And this comes on the heels of them actually winning a, a couple uh, medals in uh, the World Beer Competition. So uh, there's something going on here, something pretty special. I don't know if it's the brewer, the ingredients, the beer spa styles, or uh, is there something in the water here in Nelson County? Let's go inside and find out, right here on My Jeep TV. Okay, so we move back inside here and uh, into the, the bowels of the production facility here at Devil's Backbone, and we're joined with the, the brewer at Devil's Backbone, uh, Dave Oliver, so thank you for joining us. And we have two special uh, musical guests today. We have Sarah Siskin, a singer-songwriter, and her husband, Travis Book, who is the basis for the infamous String Dusters. And uh, the reason why we're here specifically this weekend is not only to to try these award-winning beers, but it's also the inaugural weekend for the Festi uh, music festival that's held right behind me at the Devil's Backbone Fairgrounds, um, and it's the child of the infamous Ring Duster. So, uh, so tell us why, uh, what was the rationale behind the festival, uh, why, how? <laughs> well, the guys in the band, myself included, have been going to festivals, music festivals, uh, beer festivals, outdoor festivals, all kinds of gatherings of people for a really long time. It was one of those things that kept coming up in the van. How amazing would it be if we sort of put our own mark on the festival world? Did it just the way that we would want to? Because there's a lot of great festivals, but there's always you know a little something that you would tweak to make it a little bit differently. So we were out here playing at the uh, at the Brewage Trail Festival, which is sort of a, a, a beer festival and with, with music also. We were here a year ago in August, and uh, you know. We got done playing, and the sun was setting, and the vibe was great, and we were hanging out, and we were picking music and drinking incredible beer, and we started to think, maybe, we, maybe, maybe this is the place for us to try to, to, try to realize our vision for, for a festival and a gathering that, that brings together you know, people with all different range, you know, range of interests, instead of just music fans, or just people there to drink beer, or people just you know, there to ride their bike, or whatever. See if we could bring all that stuff together into one great big party. And, and that's a good point. It's the festive experience. So it's not just the usual suspects of camping, music, beer. It's biking. You guys have five K. And congratulations, you won your your. Uh, <laughs> I won my category this morning in the mountain bike race. Yeah, yeah. Good. so that was right up there at Wintergreen. Right? It was actually it actually left from here and went. They they took us right up the road and we finished right here on the ground. Yeah. Start and finished right here at Devil's Back Mountain. Yeah, that's pretty I awesome. Add, it starts here but then climbs a huge mountain. So. Climbed it twice, actually. Yeah, really? it, was, it was pretty brutal out there, but I'm, I'm glad to be here now drinking beer. Yeah, so, I mean, this isn't your average uh, music festival, obviously. And, but, I mean, yesterday was 12 hours of just amazing musicians. I mean, just a uh, railroad. I mean, so how did it, um, did you just say, okay, these are who we want, let's go get them? Yeah. The, the lineup grew largely out of our personal relationship with other bands. And we sort of made a wish list and then started to, to look at how the, how the bands would fit together and how the schedule would work through the day. And some bands fell off the list and some other ones made it on there. But the one common thread is that all the bands that are here, we have a personal relationship with. Mm -hmm. They're friends, they're family. And when we thought about throwing this massive party for you know, the people of, the, of Nelson County and of Virginia and also the String Duster fan base, we wanted to make sure that they were coming and that they got to see music that, yeah. that you know, meant something to us. We weren't just, we're not just hiring bands to try to, you know, that we think will make uh, you know, make a lot of people come to the festival. We want people to come here and discover great new music. So. And it was, because it's a wide array. I mean, you had you know, Panther Burn, Yarn, you know, it just wasn't a bluegrass festival. You no, know, Trees on styles. Fire was going crazy yeah. last night. As soon as the String Dusters ended, the fire dancers came out, they lit the bonfire, and Trees on Fire, the band went on stage, and it just, the place blew up. It was like being a, it was like being like mini Bonnaroo yeah, for yeah, a couple it was hours. pretty neat. And, and so obviously music is a big part of the business, uh, the brewing philosophy here. You guys sure. have the festival fairgrounds, you, uh, you have live music here. Uh, but tell us about that, how you try to integrate the music and the beer. Uh, I mean, we have live music about four nights a week here. Uh, Chris Trotter, our GM, is pretty influential on that. And, you know, we try to get bands that sort of fit the atmosphere here. And the atmosphere is, you know, sort of, we're in this beautiful uh, country setting. 
I, you know, I've been brewing for 14 years, and I haven't seen a brewery with as nice a view as what we had in my life. And so we try to bring acts that you know can feed off the energy here of, of the mountains, of, of you know the building that uh, Steve Crandall built here. You know, so it's rustic. We got you know barn wood floors and and uh, rustic tin on the roof. So we try to like you know just incorporate the music into the whole feeling of this place. And um, you know it's been a lot of fun. So, so a lot of the acts are they local to this area or are they regional? You know both. Uh, you know we, we do a lot of local acts and people that come back uh, periodically on a regular basis. But then we also have tied into people who are touring and through, and we really lucked out having some some great acts that you, uh, you know we might piggyback on a bigger show, but they'll come play us the next day, and it's awesome to, to like tap into that and have these people just happen to be in the neighborhood and. And, uh, so we really lucked out on some of the national accents. And what I found surprising, even last night you had a, a, a band playing here where, where Railroad Earth was playing. I actually snuck in here for a second just to peek my head in the place of packed. And you had a band set up right there. And, yeah. um, so you're not afraid to compete with the festi, you know, with the... Well, you know, I think it's more just it's adding to the experience, mm -hmm. you know, more than anything. So let's talk about the brewery. Um, you know, you've been in uh, business for almost two years. During that time, you're the most awarded Virginia Brewery, um, just uh, making fabulous wines at the Great American Beer Festival. You've had four golds, I think, last year at the same festival competition, same medals. Four, four, four medals, medals. Four medals. This yeah. year, two golds, and then uh, the World Cup. So, what is it um, that really thinks that makes you guys really start off with such a strong beer? Well, um, you know, they pretty much let me do what I want to do, and uh, I think that's a big part of it. Um, you know, I, I like to say this equipment is sort of like the canvas in which I paint. And, you know, they, they, they let me do my thing. And, you know, um, so they, this opportunity when it came up, I had to pounce on it because this is a unique opportunity to start something from the ground up, a brand new brewery, to start, you know, creating unique beers from the get go. And um, this equipment is one of the things that drew me to this is that this is really good equipment. This is designed in Germany and built in Japan. And this allows me a lot of control. So as a brewer, um, this you know really allows me just an extra step up on my craft mm -hmm. and how to, how to manipulate the process and really get the most out of what I'm trying to get out of, of a beer. And so what I also understand is every, all the beers are naturally carbonated? Yeah. So how do you do that? Uh, well, uh, what fermentation is, is yeast eating sugar and creating two things in roughly equal amounts, that's carbon dioxide and ethyl alcohol. You let mo most of the carbon dioxide escape, and all breweries do that, but what differs from me is that towards the end of fermentation, I actually seal up the tank, essentially I cork up the tank. What happens is it builds pressure, and under pressure, the, the CO2 dissolves into the beer, and that's how we get the bubbles here. It's a German technique that, um, that I was using the last two German or breweries I worked at, uh, but I also took that technique and applied it to all beers and uh, not just the Germanic ones in nature and I think you know I find that well first off it's just more natural and it's natural carbonation um, and I think the bubbles are a little finer the palate's a little smoother mm -hmm. and you know just something I feel really strongly about and you know I'm able to do that here so I do so that's yeah. just I, it, it's something unique because most breweries will artificially carbonate the beer which is fine you know uh, the fine products but I find just that if you can just go that extra step and do the natural carbonation, uh, why not? I've worked at breweries that we did both, and um, you know. But since I I started this uh, years ago, I was like, you know, there's no reason for me to, to change. I, I just still I like to do this. So, Sarah, you're a very appropriate guest, not only being a, a musician, uh, which we like to bring on the show, but um, you also have your own beer blog, where you write about uh, beers on your different tour travels. So, uh, how, how did that start? Well, it started just because uh, I like to sample local beers uh, wherever I go. I like to see how the flavors differ on, you know, depending on what part of the country and part of the world. Because I, I actually um, did some of my blogging in Europe last year. Um, so it's just, yeah, I'm, I'm, I love to cook, so I'm really sensitive to different flavors. And um, so I started, it was just sort of a personal preference to every time I played in a, a, a town that I'd never been to, I tried to find a microbrewery or a brewery nearby or sometimes it was convenient that I was actually playing a brewery. Uh -huh. um, 
and just sample one or two. And uh, what happened was I, I thought, well, why don't I just start documenting this? Because there's people out there who like to do the same mm -hmm. thing, and I just happen to do it while I'm touring and performing. So I started the blog, and uh, it just sort of caught on with a lot of fans. I ended up having fans show up to shows, bringing me local beer. And um, Travis and I have toured together quite a bit in Colorado, which is, you know, brewery heaven. Yeah, and we've had we've yeah. had a couple fans come up to us and invite us to their house to taste their home Super, brew. Really? So it's just been, um, it's added to my experience as a performer. Um, and exactly what you said about how the music just integrates into the experience of the, I think there's something really um, parallel about the different flavors of beer and different tastes of food. You can sort of parallel that to different styles of music. And also I love how, um, you know, the, depending on the topography and if you're in the mountains or if you're near the coast, how the flavors differ. And it's just something that's always interested me. And so yeah. I try and keep the blog updated. I'm not really yeah, I did notice it has been a while. So maybe this will be the first, this will be the impetus oh, yeah. for you to you know, start. But you bring in a good point. And, and the, the, for the wine world, there's a the French term, Ferrar, which is sort of like the wine is representative of the area. Right. The being, and, and is that possible? I mean, can you relate? I mean, this area is, is uh, it's like Little Napa Valley when you're driving down 151. Um, there's about a dozen different nice wineries. They're really, really excellent wineries. So can you relate that to beer? I, I think yes and no. I think on, on a, uh, a large scale, you kind of can, but that's changing. And what I mean by that is that the East Coast was known for more uh, maltier beers, uh, a little more maybe traditionally English in nature when craft brewing began, you know, 20 years ago or so. And then you have the West Coast, which is very known for its hop forward beers. Uh, you know, the hops are grown there. Um, very aggressive beers coming out of there. But I think right now everything is sort of, um, you know, those old rules are thrown out the door because, you know, there are plenty of East Coast brewers with really hoppy beers. Um, and so, you know, well, what's unique about, like, to say the beer is here, what, what can be is, say, you know, water, for mm -hmm. example. Oh, that's, um, the, that's, that's, you know, the majority yeah. of the beer, you know. I'm using uh, well water, and it's extremely soft, and it's the first time in my career that I've actually used well water. I've used, used city water that we filter to remove the chlorine or something uh -huh. like that. But, you know, this is the most indigenous part of beer is water, and I can be happy with the water that I have here because it is soft is that famous water from Pilsen, where the first Pilsner was, uh -huh. comes from, that it, that gives me kind of a, a blank slate to build upon. And uh, some of my beers, I don't touch the water, but other beers, I adjust to kind of get them close to maybe some of the, the great uh, waters of the, of the world. And there are certain towns that are known for the water in the brewing world. Uh, Pilsen for Pilsners, you have Burden on Trent for uh, English IPAs, uh, Dublin for Stouts, Munich. So, so that's a part, I guess, of Tawara, but you know, I can kind of adjust it too, right. so it's kind of fun to do that, actually. And you mentioned the water. It's interesting. I just learned that uh, there's a distillery that's gonna, it's being built uh, not far from here, and it's a Scottish distillery that's wanted an American presence, and they sampled the water throughout the United States, and they decided that here in Nelson County, the, the well water, I believe, is what they wanted to use. Uh, so right. there, there, there is something to be said about the, you know, the area here contributing to your flavors. Yeah. Um, so what exactly are we? We've got four beers here. Um, um, we got um, we have the Gold Leaf Lager, which is uh, one of our four year round beers, and it's um, it's it, I guess you could call it an international style pilsner or or a Helles, which is a German just pale lager. Um, it's won uh, us two medals this year at the gold at this year's Great American Beer Festival and mm -hmm. gold at last year's Great American Beer Festival in the International Style Pilsner category. And, um, you know, it's just a nice, pale, all malt lager. Um, so there's no hops at all? I mean. Oh, there are hops. Oh, okay. yeah. I mean, no, well, when yeah. I say all malt, I mean, it, it doesn't have, like, corn or rice okay. right. to adulterate it. Um, just a nice, dry, crisp, 
uh, everyday drinking beer. It's one of my favorites. A lot of times, you know, people say, "Oh, you must like the really dark ones." I'm like, not necessarily, because a a light beer or a uh, a pale beer, especially a pale lager, is often uh, akin to like the pinnacle of uh, the brewer's art, because any imperfection stands out in a beer like this. Right. There, are, there aren't a lot of hops or malt flavors there to hide it. So what you want is a really delicate body and delicate flavor. So, uh, you know, a beer like this, well, it might not be exciting to a beer geek, for example. Uh, you know, it, a, a lot of brewers and a lot of my friends are brewers really, they really put a lot of um, pride into their, their, their lightest creations mm -hmm. because that's really where art and science come together. And, and it will show if it's not right, essentially. Yeah. Now, with, with your natural carbonation, do you actually have to serve it at a certain temperature? Because I know as the beer warms, it releases more of the CO2. So do you actually have a level that for all you different beers of, of temperature? Well, all the beers are served at the same temperature. Uh, we have a walk-in cooler with tanks in it. Um, but during fermentation, that, that does uh, I have to adjust things. For example, when I'm naturally carbonated in ale, which is warmer, the natural carbonate lager, I have to adjust mm -hmm. and, and take that into consideration because then you have physics and stuff, uh, gas, something you know, like Foucault's laws, so anyway, right. I can't even remember them, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's like these partial pressure laws, but it's like, you know, temperature and pressure really dictate uh, how fast and how much CO2 you go into us. That's why 20% of your job is a chemist, 80% is a janitor. Right, You're right. cleaning and you're, you're doing chemistry experiments. So, so um, when you guys are at home, you know, what particular beer styles do you guys like to drink? I love ales, pale ales, and um, I love dark beers, but I've really, in the last several years, I've become attached to just clean ales, like um, Anchor Steam is one of my favorites, just to give an example. And um, you really love dark beer. I like, yeah. I, I, I love beer, and if I'm not careful, I'll drink a thousand beers. Mm -hmm. In, in a sitting, and, and so for me, uh, drinking something that's, that's complex, has high al alcohol content, and requires some effort on my part, allows me allows me a, a real complete experience without slow um, down without, uh, without, without <laughs> the side the, the sort of side effects sometimes of, of tearing through more beers than I want. So um, I love to drink and taste all kinds of beers. I tend to lean toward the, the darker, more more sort of complex things. Partly for that reason, yeah. keeps me honest. So we're we're getting that way, but this is a really good. I mean, this this is just oh, a, this is a it's flavorful and just. Uh, I'm really impressed. I mean, with that. you're right. The log, you know, loggers don't really get the the name recognition. You know, mostly when a microbrew, but this is this is definitely a really fine beer. I will say, for our birthday, we have the same birthday. He really? Two huh? years ago, he bought us a he installed a kegerator into our basement, and we had. I think we had, um, there's a local brewery in Nashville called Yazoo, so we had a couple of Yazoo kegs, and then we had a Shiner box keg, just sort of like, you know, an easy beer bit. We found that we drank yeah. a lot of beer when we had that, so we're trying to sell right. a kegerator. Yeah, yeah, anybody, yeah, if anybody, anybody out there wants yeah. to buy a kegerator. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's dangerous. Uh, it's very dangerous. Yeah, it saves on uh, it's buying bottles, though. Right. <laughs> right. So you guys ever tried home brewing? We haven't. We've talked about it. We're just that we travel so much. Mm -hmm. We haven't found enough time. Yeah. But we, yeah, what have you? And this is this is another thing talking about this area. I'm driving yeah. through, and there's a there's a home brew shop right down the road. No, it's for just open. Yeah. And the guy was out there doing doing a demonstration. Was, um, yeah. yesterday afternoon. Of, of he was uh, cr crushing his malt, and he was yeah. then. Uh, unfortunately, it was the same time you were playing yesterday, and he was actually going to be pouring the beers that he made the previous week. Uh, so it's, it's a yeah. lot going on here. I, well, I'd like to give that a shot at some point. I imagine it's kind of like music, where, where once you start to try to learn how to play music yourself, it gives you a much much deeper understanding and appreciation exactly. for for people who do it professionally, exactly, yeah. or or not not even that, but but people who do it in, in, in varying depths. And and I think it's probably the same thing with brewing. I think for me to try to to try to you know whip up a batch of beer myself. Or, would yeah. probably change the entire And, and they, they obviously have the beer making for dummies where you get the extracts and you just dump them in, you know. <laughs> right. But you definitely want to take the grains and, and you know, I tell people you know, it's it can be as, as simple or as complex as you want to make right. it. And but once you start, 
there is no end to it. It's, there's no end to what you're going to learn or what you can do. It, but you got to start somewhere, but uh, it can be simple or I know some homebrewers put thousands of dollars into their systems and they have this really complex stuff and, you know, it, it can be addictive like music, I think, you know, it gets in your soul and you just got to do the, it. The more, the more you get into it, the more you're into it. Yeah. So what's sense. the next one we have? Here? Well, the next one is the, the String Duster. And uh, this is the beer that uh, came up uh, to honor the band and the festival. And what I did here was to make sort of a multi-grain ale. Kind of, I wanted to do sort of a rustic beer that that is not too strong. It's still what's called a session beer. That, you know, you can drink a few of them. It's about 4.6% alcohol. It's not a, a huge beer by any means, but I wanted something that you know kind of celebrates the harvest time and that's something that's approachable and something that you know looks a little rustic but easy drinking too and so i used uh some dark wheat in this i used some flaked uh barley I used some uh toasted wheat and some flaked oats in this as well as barley malt uh to create kind of a beer that's really soft on the palate and kind of just sort of uh I, I just, I said it before, but rustic, you know, it's kind of what I was going for in this. And, uh, so would this be year-round beer now, or is it uh, just for the, this I don't know. Uh, you know, this has been um, our fastest selling beer ever. Uh, so oh. by tomorrow, I think I would have gone through 20 kegs of it. And that's just one one beer, you know, and we've been selling a lot of other beer too, but this has been the fastest seller um, out of, well, this weekend, but out of any seasonal beer too or non-seasonal beer, for that matter, in a, in a time period. This has just been flying out of here, so it's uh, been really well received, which is awesome. So did you guys have any input into the, uh, or did you even know that they were going to do this? We knew, we knew that Jason was planning on doing something, and we didn't, we didn't have, we didn't, we didn't give him much input. We, we, we've tasted your beers, and we had faith that whatever you came up with would be Although amazing. You, you, you may have, actually, <laughs> uh, two years ago, well, you guys met with Steve and had a meeting here. Uh, I remember talking to you guys real briefly and, and kind of talked about maybe like a, a Harvest Brown Ale. Well, that kind of came up and this is sort of the result. Well, I wasn't trying to, I kind of turned it down on color, didn't want it um, to be as dark because I had some other darker beers on. And I thought, you know, I want something that has color, has body, but not being too much of any one thing. So it kind of did start with that conversation two years ago. We definitely have a few guys in the band that are really big on on, on wheat beers, especially you know after our trip to Germany. Uh, and right. so it, it, it was uh, I, I think we were we were pleased to see that um, you know you can you can you can see a wheat beer from a mile away as that as that sort of unfiltered element yeah. to it, and, and and it's it's fantastic beer. Like you said, it's the kind of thing that you can you can get into a few of them um, and and. And it won't, you know, won't alter the course of your day. Right. And the great thing you say that you can see it. There's a visual aspect to it, but there's also that kind of healthy, um, kind of unadulterated aspect too. Yeah, it's not filtered. This is sort of beer in its living state. You know, it's naturally carbonated, it's unfiltered. You know, it uses multi grains. It's kind of a wholesome product too, in a, in a way. Yeah. So it's funny. Some bands expire to, you know, be IBV. Eight winners, but you know how many bands have a beer named after them? You know, we aspire to do lots of things, <laughs> and having a beer named after us is definitely on the list. Now they're it's just really checking amazing. off the list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really amazing. Yeah, win mountain bike race, uh, have beer, have a festival, uh, yeah, world's beer. greatest exactly. festival. Yeah. It's everything's going great so far, and the, and the beer is perfect. Yeah. That's it. Sarah, well, um, yesterday you had two really great sets, and. Um, What's really interesting for many people don't realize is that you, and it's also interesting that with that you like beer, is that you have a food allergy. And so how does that affect actually, you know, tasting the beers or even yeah. just with your vocals? It's a real mystery. Um, and I was talking to Jason a little bit about it before the interview. Um, I, all of my allergy testing that's been done by doctors has been inconclusive. Um, I'm sort of a mystery case and I, I've just figured out my allergies from trial and error and um, I don't do dairy and um, I try not to do corn because that inflames me and it's all sinus reaction, it's not intestinal. Um, but the whole wheat 
gluten thing. I'm still figuring it out um, because I can drink pretty much any beer. So that's why Travis is taking over that's that one. That's why he's yeah. taking the wheat beer because I can do a little bit of it, but the wheat beers make me congested. Mm -hmm. um, but everything else doesn't, and so I'm not, I don't know, we were going to chat some more about it because I'm, I'm trying to figure out in the brewing process maybe what's different with the wheat beer versus maybe just because it has a lot more raw wheat added to it. Um, but So is there a regimen you have to go through like the day before you're going to perform? No, I can't eat this or I can't? Oh yeah, I, well I, I pretty much just don't eat, I don't eat dairy or corn. I mean, I can do some, if corn is processed like into a beer or into, obviously corn is in a lot of things, corn syrup, I can do a little bit of that. Um, but I just, I stay away from those things. I don't do bread and pasta and things that I know have heavy wheat content pretty much daily. And I would say, yeah, if I know I'm doing a, a big performance uh, the next day, I try and eat as clean as possible, vegetables and rice and we eat a lot of quinoa and um, maybe, you know, lean proteins like fish or chicken. So, yeah, I just have to watch. You, you hide it well because you sing amazing. Thank I mean, you. No, you wouldn't know it. Yeah, I'm, bit, I'm lucky. It doesn't affect, it really doesn't affect my voice unless, like I, I said, if I do, if I have a big, tall hypervisor, I'm probably going to have some issues. Did you notice anything uh, with with uh, the string duster? Yeah, I actually, um, I tried it the other night because so I was really excited. And um, I didn't necessarily react right away, but I could tell that it was the type of wheat beer that usually gives me some inflammation. Yeah. So, um, so I drink He beer just drinks the rest. But like now, I've had a couple sips and line. I'm okay. But if I do a whole glass, I'll probably notice. Yeah. So, I don't know, it's, it's still a mystery. Um, it's not keeping me from <laughs> drinking all the other beers. So. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we have two more that we have to taste here. Um, so what are we drinking? This is uh, the Ale of Fergus, which um, out of all the seasonal beers I've done, and I do a lot, I usually have six different specialty beers or seasonal beers on at one time, plus the four house beers. So for a total of ten different beers. Um, this one we opened the restaurant with is called Ale of Fergus. And uh, it's probably the, the one that's returned the most times. And this beer's had a, a subtle evolution, but what it's always been is a uh, brown ale that's a session beer, about 4% alcohol. So it has color, has uh, malt flavor, but uh, you can drink a few of them. And um, this beer initially started out as a, a Scottish 60 shilling, which is kind of a, a lighter in alcohol, Scottish style. But it's kind of evolved into uh, an English mild, which um, I, some of the roasty notes have been subdued and some more of the caramel toffee notes have come out. And um, this beer just uh, got us a bronze at the Great American Beer Festival, mm -hmm. so we're happy for it. And especially because it's sort of an old favorite that we uh, would like to bring out uh, time and time again. Yeah. It's good, very smooth. I mean, for a brown ale. I mean, definitely drinkable. And what do you guys think? It's exceptional. Yeah. Oh yeah, I can definitely taste the caramel undertones to it, which is nice. But it's not overpowering at all. It's really subtle. And what I like about this style too is like is that it's light in alcohol, so you can have a caramel flavor, but it's not weighing on you. It's yeah. not like kind of coating the tongue or being too heavy. It's not and sweet too sweet either. Yeah. 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 Because Travis, I can't uh, let you out of here without talking a little bit about the spring dusters. Okay. And, and the one thing I really enjoy about you guys is just the way you sh your style is. You're all lined up, and, and then, you know, you being a bassist, you know, you're front and center. Um, usually, you know, the bassist guy is sort of in the back, and you know, you're unplugging. But uh, but then what you guys do is once you guys are all lined up, and once you play, start playing, you know, you sort of just move back and forth like you're, when somebody else takes a lead. You're, you're supporting them. You know, everyone moves around. So, how did that start? Um, it just it just sort of happened naturally. There was a there was a, a desire on stage. You know, six guys all strung out in a line, uh, all facing out. It, 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 it's it's difficult to be really collaborative and to be really creating music together when you're not looking at people and you're not even really in the same physical space. You know, so just. In, in an effort to play better, more connected music, 
we, we started to move around. And, and it was essential that we had, you know, pickup systems because, you know, a lot of bluegrass or acoustic bands, they're stuck in front of their yeah. microphone or in front of their monitor system too. We use in-ear monitors and they're all plugged in. So no matter where we go, the sound is always the same. And we found that when we, you know, when two guys are improvising together, if they can face each other, you know, get right in each other's business, the music really, you know, congeals and elevates in a way that it doesn't if people are just sort of standing, doing their thing. So it 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 hap it sort of started to happen really naturally, and then we and then we sort of we got some feedback from people watching, um, and also realized just by virtue of, of doing it that it was it was a really positive thing. The music was really went great places when we did that. We freed ourselves up from feeling like we had to be in a stationary spot. And it's funny, I watching yesterday when you're, you're playing with Sarah and then when Andy Falco came and, and joined us, there's a couple times I think you had your, your instincts where you're ready to pick up your bass and go, when he started jamming away, you're ready to, to move around. And uh -huh. uh, you, I think you had to control yourself on that. But, but also, I think you brought out sort of um, how that style emits for the venue. And something like this, when you're playing in front of a fans that are right there in front of the stage, um, as opposed to where I've seen you at more of a, a recital type of uh, place where like the, the Paramount Theater where you're sitting down or, or like we talked about Jam and Java versus like IOTA, where that presence sort of feeds off you guys. And so I can see where you guys moving next to each other sort of feeds off, you guys feed off each other's energy as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, when, when a band is at its best, uh, the band and the audience are all on the same page. Everyone is right there in the present moment, creating and, and, and absorbing the music. And we're all, you know, the audience is creating the experience almost as much as, as the band. And there becomes, it, there's sort of, it's, it's like, some people refer to it as like a feedback loop where you're getting energy from the audience and then you're feeding it back to them. And for me, it's more of a, you know, when, 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 when the bands, when we're all present, when we're playing the music, when we're not thinking about how well we're playing. We're not thinking about the sound. We're not thinking about the audience reaction. And further, when the, when the audience isn't, they're not self-conscious about if people think they're dancing cool, or they're not like worried about like trying to like impress somebody, you know, or all the other million things, million places that their head could be other than absorbed in the music. When everybody gets to that place where we're all right there in the moment doing the music, creating it together, that's when it really happens. And I mean, that, that happened last night. It doesn't happen all the time. And when it doesn't happen, that's fine also. You know, it's sort of a magical thing, but that's that, that's sort of what we'd envisioned with, with the Festi experience, bringing people together and creating a place where people could be themselves and feel comfortable and be able to just be present and not, not worry about anything else. So, so us being able to move around and be loose and, and experience the music on stage however we want to, I think that, that that really frees up the audience to do the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, I'm really looking forward to getting to your performance today. Today should be so, fun. Be we'll see. Every day is a little different, yeah. you know? So. so we have one more. Um, I taste a little coffee in this one. Uh, a little coffee. A little, little <laughs> bit. Um, with, uh, so tell us about this one. Um, this beer is a, what we call the Baltic coffee, and it's a coffee-flavored Baltic porter. And what por Baltic porters are, are actually strong black lagers that originated in the Baltic region, Eastern Europe, uh, and Baltic Sea area. As sort of a response to the popularity of Imperial Stouts, which was an ale, strong black ale, so these northern countries wanted to do their own version, but they were more lager brewers, so they did a strong black lager. And so interestingly enough, this blends some characteristics of a Bach beer, which is a strong lager, to some flavors of porters, which typically are ales. Uh, so I took our Baltic Porter and then uh, added um, fresh um, locally roasted Traeger Brothers coffee to it. And I uh, used the Mexican variety. They're all organic, fair trade coffee roasters in Loveston, our county seat. And um, the result is you know, a beer that has nice coffee flavors that plays off of the dark chocolatey malt notes that come, you know, will come from the malt. And, um, and you know, it's funny, this is the first brewery I've ever added coffee to beer at. Um, last couple jobs were all German, they kind of frown upon that sort of thing. And, and, and then before that, it just never came up. But so I had this opportunity to, and of course I'm gonna use the locally roasted coffee. Uh, it's the freshest and, you know, we wanna support the local, the local businesses. But 
I don't know. It's it just. It just works so well, I think. It does. Because yeah. the coffee is subtle. It's, it's not, I've had coffee stouts or coffee uh, porters where it just, the coffee is, it, you might as well drink it in the, in the morning, you know, it, instead of your regular coffee because it's yeah. so strong. But this definitely so blends right in. I think, interestingly enough, this is a strong beer. The coffee actually helps balance it out a little bit by adding, um, it almost makes it a little smoother, at least a little seem less alcoholic. Although this beer is about 8%, so it's not a, a light beer by no, any, not any at all. means. Um, and you know, I'm proud to say this one won as a gold medal at the Great American Beer Festival of Coffee Flavored Beer. And I then last, or earlier this year at the World Beer Cup, we got a bronze for the Morning Bear, which is our Imperial Stout with coffee. So with these dark beers, uh, whether it's a Imperial Stout or a Baltic Porter, I, I, I do like that take a portion of it off and add the coffee, kind of make it special, you know, a real small batch thing, you know, where I've only made 70 gallons of this. So I took 70 gallons off of a 260 gallon tank just to make this one beer. So it's extremely limited run, yeah. extremely I'm surprised uh, rare. we have any left. Yeah, well, it's, it's almost gone. Yeah. I think this weekend's going to put a big dent in it. Yeah. Yeah. I bet. Um, it's, it's, it's tremendous. Yeah. So I, I'm very glad we came here. I mean, the, the beers here are tremendous. Even the ones that I've sampled before besides these. Um, so there's definitely something we're doing right here. Uh, so, so thank you for joining us today. And thank you, too, for taking time out of your busy media and of course. performing schedule. Thanks for and having us. And I appreciate thank it. Thank you for and thanks for oh, the beers. Yeah. <laughs> this is great. And uh, so stay great. tuned for a, a live performance by Sarah and Travis. And we'll see you next time on My Dude TV. So for um, any of those of you who were not here earlier today for my first set, um, I am joined up here on stage by um, a string tester, Travis Buck on the bass. Yes. You know they named a beer after those guys. And um, you know, why just have one duster on stage when you can have two? So I'm going to welcome up a uh, very special guest um, here. He's got his hat today and it's really cool. Welcome Andy Falco. Um, so let's do this wildfire featuring Andy Falco.
and gentlemen, Travis Cook, Andy Falco, featuring Andy Falco, Festi, Festi. Go forth and festivate. Enjoy yourselves. It's your festival. This festival is the brainchild of this band, and we think they've done a really.